Welcome to the AWS Research IT Training Series. I'm Marcy Collinson, your session correspondent and the Senior Scientific Research Programs Manager for the AWS Research Team. Today, we are delighted to have Dr. Lisa McFerrin here to discuss genomics, data transfer, and storage in the cloud. Dr. McFerrin is a senior bioinformaticist at AWS, where she leads initiatives supporting the genomics industry as part of worldwide business development. Prior to AWS, Dr. McFerrin worked at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, where she specialized in the development of software and methods that bridge genomic and clinical data to advance the understanding of cancer biology and to improve patient care. Dr. McFerrin has a background in math and computer science and obtained her PhD in bioinformatics from North Carolina State University. We will reserve the last five to 10 minutes of the session for a Q&A portion, but please feel free to place any questions that you may have during the presentation in the questions queue in the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we will read them aloud later on. So without further ado, I'll pass the microphone over to Dr. McFerrin. Dr. McFerrin, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Marcy. Appreciate the introduction. Uh, I have a lot of content to cover. Uh, I'll probably speak a bit too quickly, but this will be recorded. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the genomic data and transfer and storage, uh, really focusing on, on how AWS is helping to support that. To set the context, we're going to start by walking through the challenges of genomic data uh, and, and the size and scale and management of it. Uh, then bridge into some of the broader contextual initiatives of what AWS is doing in the genomic space uh, with some customer use cases around how they are storing and, and transferring their data and using that. And then I will, uh, at the end, delve a little bit more into the techie field of our services and capabilities, um, but still keeping it pretty high level of what it is that we, we are doing in this space. So to start, I wanted to just kind of lay the groundwork about you know, what really is a precision medicine revolution that we are experiencing. Uh, if you've seen recently, there have been articles out that are showcasing how the Human Genome Project started about 30 years ago. Uh, it took 13 years for the first genome to be sequenced, um, cost billions of dollars to be done, uh, and it it often, it, it took a lot of work to get there, but now the genomics is fairly ubiquitous across uh, biology and uh, entering more and more into the healthcare space. Uh, however, with as much as we are now gaining in our sequencing and capabilities, uh, the cost being driven down and the amount of data being generated, there's still so much more that is needed to be understood about the genome, uh, the variation among individuals, how it impacts uh, individuals, but then uh, across populations. Uh, but it's this, this drive towards the more data uh, and the, the more diversity of the data that is helping to bring the size and uh, add the layers of complexity and the, the questions uh, that are really needed in this field to drive that innovation and application in the healthcare and life sciences industries. Now, parallel to the technology uh, revolution that has happened within the sequencing space uh, is cloud computing. So AWS was launched in 2006, so that's about 15 years ago. Uh, and what this now offers is the scalable infrastructure to be able to store and aggregate and share the, the type of data that genomics data is now producing. Uh, and it also provides the agile computing and the parallelization of that, that compute power to help change that data into information. Uh, machine learning models have been around for decades, but it's now through coupling of the generation of this data and the accessibility of the data and the compute in the scalability of the cloud that is allowing organizations to be able to run these machine learning and analytic models to, to train, to test, and to learn uh, from this information and ultimately create both just the retrospective data sets, but also apply this for prospective uh, analysis and, and precision medicine support. And then just the third tier of that, that really helps bring this all back to the patient because so much of what we need to make sure that we keep our eye on is the, the ethics and the, the application of this, that this is really driven towards supporting patient outcomes and improving those patient outcomes. 
Uh, there's been huge biotech advances from uh, just this past year. Uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded for the, the CRISPR genome editing. Uh, there's significant improvements that have been going on for targeted therapeutics, polygenic risk scores, applications of genomic sequencing in clinics, um, and just the ability to uh, improve some of the lab technologies of how to work with the cells uh, and be able to improve what it is that we've learned from the genomics and the, the technology into both the labs and the clinic. So I, I truly believe that we are at an inflection point um, that has just been continuing to move in this industry. Uh, and these three different fields are coming together uh, to really revolutionize how we approach healthcare. And so this is just one slide to help dive into some of those details. Uh, you know, the genome sequencing and the technology has improved to the extent that we have surpassed the $1,000 genome. Uh, I've seen some quotes that we're now at about, about $600 to be able to sequence a whole genome uh, for human at 30x coverage. And ultimately, this is driving adoption across the industry uh, and producing large-scale data volumes. Uh, organizations that previously weren't able to do genomic sequencing are now able to, at a cost-effective manner, be able to adopt it. And those that were already in the field are able to scale it up at a much higher rate. And so we're seeing these massive data volumes uh, coupled with the, the sequencing costs and the improvements in workflow automation that is driving this data volume. And Illumina NovaSeq is generating 750 terabytes of data at least per sequencer and can uh, utilize the Dragon technology for data processing and be able to process a single genome in under 30 minutes. So we're seeing a massive influx in both the volume as well as the velocity of the data that is being generated. Now, I've been speaking a lot around genome sequencing, which is focusing on the DNA, but there's also a significant amount of variety of data. Uh, when we're thinking about DNA, there's also many other contexts of how to be able to uh, understand a cell, a tissue, a patient. And so being able to do RNA sequencing uh, look at microbiomes, look at immune repertoire, uh, be able to couple that with methylation or acetylation analysis, uh, helps to give a better understanding of what, what is going on in that cell, what is going on in that individual, uh, and being able to couple this multi-omics and multimodal data uh, is incredibly in, informing the, the ability for us to add that annotation and interpretation layer. Uh, Veracity is always important in this. There's been uh, significant improvements and um, some great work done by the, the long read technologies, uh, and, and this helps unlock additional layers of the, the genomic sequencing, um, looking at structural variations and, and other components that have uh, applications in cancer and population sequencing. Uh, so there's just huge momentum in this field, uh, really pushing towards that big data uh, and those four of these that we see that are happening. Um, so while I've been talking about the, the broader field, I, I also want to look at a little bit of the variety of the sequencing um, within the, the genome and the different ways and applications this can arise. Uh, so not everybody's going to do whole genome sequencing, and that's okay. We, we need to think about the different applications uh, for where genomics is, is useful in the field. And so genotyping is one approach where you can look at small samples of you know, particular genes. Uh, this is largely used to be able to validate if a particular variant exists within a sample, um, highly relevant within clinical applications. And this type of data will be generally small, um, and, and it helps for real-time analysis and can be run on-prem. Um, and then moving into large-scale arrays, this is where you can start tiling genomes uh, and be able to look more broadly, but still uh, at kind of a, a kilobase level of data file sizes and um, the an analysis layer of being able to understand what, what is happening at a genetic uh, situation. Uh, but ultimately, as these data sizes and the applications grow in terms of the need to not just validate but also discover uh, is where you start moving into the exome and genome sequencing. Uh, exome sequencing is looking at the, uh, the, the genes, basically, the, the exons of a genome, and it's 
pretty much 1% of the whole genome. Uh, so it's about 10 gigabytes as far as file sizes when you're looking at uh, the, the processed data there, as opposed to whole genome sequencing, which is 100 to 150 gigabytes of data when you're looking across all 3 billion positions of a human genome. Um, when you're also doing a whole genome sequencing, you're not looking at each of those 3 billion positions only once, you're doing it at depth and at coverage, typically around 30x. So you're seeing, on average, 30 uh, positions, so 30, 30 nucleotides of, of each of those positions to have confidence and that, that veracity layer of what data is being produced. And so these create very large file sizes. And when you're talking about population level sequencing, uh, repetitive sequencing, this data becomes quite large and ultimately outpaces the capability of on-premises data centers to be able to store it, uh, but also to be able to analyze it. Uh, so these are just ways to be able to consider the, the data types that you're operating with, uh, but also the scale and considerations needed to be able to manage it. And so genomics data is fantastic. But it also is important to interpret the genomic data in context uh, and also that application. And so the, the data is transforming the way that businesses are innovating. More companies are adopting genomic sequencing now uh, and coupling it with other data types, um, whether they're looking at uh, clinical imaging data types or pathology imaging types, uh, bringing in other types of clinical data uh, and running analytics or machine learning analysis on it. Uh, this is helping to drive health economics and outcomes research, companion diagnostics, drug discovery, uh, the, the network and multimodal data access and integration is continuing to increase and the demand of more data sources uh, access to more data will only continue to increase. And that's best represented by what we are seeing across the globe. Um, millions of individuals are participating in population sequencing initiatives. Um, there's been over $4 billion have been earmarked across over 50 different uh, initiatives worldwide. Uh, and there's five of the, the 10 largest economies within the world have precision medicine initiatives. Australia is looking to sequence 25 million. Uh, US has the All of Us Precision Medicine Initiative with 1 million. Uh, there's the UK Biobank data that has already processed uh, from the genotyping to the whole exome and into the whole genome for 500,000 individuals. Uh, Genomics England has looked at over 100,000 individuals uh, and then also brought in additional really relevant data sets and timely for things like COVID analysis. Uh, they looked to sequence an additional 35,000 individuals, 25,000 of which, 25, of which um, had severe symptoms, another 10 with mild symptoms, and we're trying to best understand uh, where those symptoms were originating from and, and some of the genetic uh, biomarkers that were contributing to uh, just the, the relevance of the, the virulence of COVID and, and the SARS-CoV-2. So there's a huge amount of, of data that is being generated and application um, really at a global scale. Uh, groups like the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health are, are working of, across these groups, um, both from a, a research perspective and a, a policy perspective to help best understand standards so that um, some of these, these initiatives can collaborate and we can really realize the, the potential of all this data that is being generated. And that's just what I wanted to speak briefly about on this, the goals of some of these sequencing initiatives and why it matters to have so much of this genetic data um, be available and, and what it brings to bear within the healthcare and life sciences community. Uh, and one of the first things is just really to increase the diagnostic rate for uncommon genetic disorders. Uh, if you think about any particular clinic that uh, is receiving patients, uh, if they come across a symptom set that they don't know how to diagnose, uh, it may come across as an uncommon genetic disorder or undiagnosed or rare disease. Uh, but 
what happens is that if they don't see more of those types of symptoms or more of those types of individuals, they there's not a clear path forward for how to treat the one that they have seen. And so these large scale population sequencing initiatives and the interoperability of them is helping to build that data uh, compatibility and searchability uh, all within a, a patient consenting and, and regulatory and compliance framework to be able to better understand and build the, the sufficient data sizes to find the patterns that can help unravel you know, some of the underpinnings of the genetic disease uh, and make it less obscure, uh, you know, help shorten that diagnostic odyssey and, and that journey that those patients go under uh, to know that they're not alone, that there are others out there and you can learn from each other uh, to improve the, the diagnostic outcome uh, for those individuals. So huge implications for rare and undiagnosed disease. Uh, but then also for diseases that we do have a, a decent knowledge of and continuing to have a better understanding, such as cancer, uh, the more genetic data that we can have uh, can help improve the diagnosis and treatment selection of them. Uh, that ultimately is the goal of precision medicine. Um, you know, cancer initially was looked at as a organ-specific disease. You had lung cancer, you had breast cancer, um, you, you had colon cancer. And there are certain genetic biomarkers that are more relevant and, and pertinent to some of those organs and systems, but cancer is uh, described as a disease of mutations. And some of those mutations are common across these different cancer types. Uh, so what we're really discovering is that by increasing the amount of, of data that is available, uh, we can start unlocking um, some of our preconceived notions and just have the better pattern recognition um, and be able to dive into more of those details uh, and subsets and enrichment and treatment selection uh, and pharmacogenomics that can help improve not just the diagnosis, but also the treatment selection for those individuals. Uh, so huge amount of, of knowledge that has been gained and will continue to be gained from this type of sequencing and application. Uh, a third area that is, is critically important is to best address the medical research gaps for underrepresented populations. Uh, this not only will help you know, the entire population globally uh, to better understand the natural variation that exists uh, within the human genome, the amount of constraint and conservation of, of genes, um, you know, what, what naturally occurring variants would be benign versus pathogenic. Uh, but it, it's really important to also understand and, and best support and build out those treatment plans for these underrepresented populations to make sure that they are also being served. Um, you know, to date, most of the genetic sequencing globally has been focusing and, and utilizing uh, data that's been available off of European ancestry. Uh, so there's so much more to be gained um, just broadly and specifically for these other populations um, by being able to uh, help increase the diversity um, and the, the research towards that need. And ultimately, these, these last two bullet points um, bring it home of to be able to achieve those aims, we need the big data analysis, the research and the innovation and to bring these biomedical communities together to learn from each other, to apply those learnings uh, and to be able to continue to propel the genomics field forward. And so there are additional considerations that need to be made um, I, I, I'm putting the, the FAIR genomics workloads at the top here uh, to really highlight the, the principles around data as well as methods uh, to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, so I, I started out by discussing some of the, the many different data types, the different data sizes, um, but then for these data to be most applicable within your organization and to collaborate across organizations, uh, you need the secure access to the internal shared and public data that's available, clearly with cross being front and center, the data sizes um, 
and the analytics on top of it. Uh, nobody wants a, a surprise bill on anything. So making sure that everything is, is clear cut in terms of uh, the projections of the, the cost and spend. But uh, to be able to really increase that, that findability and accessibility uh, is where I will be focusing the data transfer and storage conversation today. Um, and with these data sizes being what they are and the, the complexity of it, it's really becoming too large and too difficult and the, the security layer around it to move data around. Uh, you know, the, the days are gone of shipping hard drives uh, across the state or across the globe. They're, the cloud is meant to be able to help support that uh, and help bring the compute to the data uh, for the to reduce the burden of being able to access it, be able to bring the compute on it, and have uh, faster time to science, faster time to discovery, and uh, the lower latency of that analysis. Uh, something else to consider as you're working on these data types is the type of analysis that you will be running. Uh, there's a need for maybe CPUs, GPUs, uh, the Dragon sequencing uses uh, FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, uh, which run our F1 instances. Uh, and so there's a, a certain level of variety that uh, needs to be considered. Uh, as well as the capacity and the, the bursting uh, of the batches that often occur of how genomics data is processed and, and managed. Uh, so again, the cloud can be very useful in that regard. Uh, and then just to round out that uh, the idea that the FAIR principles here is the ability to track the provenance to increase the data reuse. Uh, and there's, there's huge need and drive towards not recreating the undifferentiated heavy lifting, but being able to start from the, the latest discovery and the latest collaboration, and then continue to move the field forward. Uh, so being able to capture the metadata, understand how it was processed, what data it is you're looking at, uh, what tools were used to be able to generate it, uh, and then be able to reuse that in different applications uh, whether you're looking at your, your DNA with RNA and then that can be coupled to clinical data, uh, really being able to unlock the, the utility of that data is very important and having the proper metadata capture around it is critical for that to be able to be achieved. Um, and, and that goes tightly with the ability to have the, the versioning and deployment of these methods and apps in a reusable and repeatable fashion. So that was a lot of the, the, the challenges and kind of the landscape of where we're at in just the, the genomics and application space. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what AWS is doing in the field to address some of these needs. Uh, standardization and security is kind of foundational, uh, especially for being able to provide infrastructure as code, uh, being able to utilize the, the services, have uh, you know, highly durable, highly available storage, as well as uh, elastic and scalable compute instances, uh, really helps remove some of that uh, infrastructure burden to be able to just get at more of the, the science and the application layer. Uh, we often talk about AWS services as being the building blocks and uh, it, it largely is, but we've also been working to um, help, in general, create some of these building blocks into more managed services, whether it be for tax ex execution, data, data analytics, or machine learning, um, but also with industry-specific focus as well, and, and that's some of the things I'll talk to you today um, about, especially around transfer and storage. Um, ultimately, the goal here is to accelerate the experimentation, to be able to best support the bioinformatics and the data scientists, um, help with the continuous integration, continuous deployment and development, um, but still enable flexibility. Um, you know, AWS is a, a whole fleet of, of builders, and, and we work with organizations that are builders and, and people that are still working in this highly emerging field. So uh, we want to create infrastructure and capabilities that enable that flexibility while still maintaining that standardization and security uh, and, and helping that through things like containers and serverless architecture 
um, so that we can meet your unique business needs uh, while still providing the, the best practices within the field. So we've done this uh, across the industry. Um, this kind of gives you a little smattering of some of the organizations we work with uh, in the genomic space, across research, across our partner network, uh, those that are applying genomics within the clinical field, um, scaling it at a population sequencing level to help support population health, uh, as well as those that are working at the direct-to-consumer level um, and, and helping bring the, the genomics uh, more within the public arena. And in working with the variety of organizations we do, uh, we've really broken down the genomics space into four major workloads. Uh, today, I'll be diving more deeply into the data transfer and storage layer, uh, but that's really just the, the foundational core to the, the three other types of workloads that you'll e experience. Um, secondary analysis and workflow automation is kind of that next layer once you've moved the data into the cloud. Uh, how do you help process it, move that data into information, uh, be able to capture the, the workflows and processing that you're able to manage um, as, as highly reproducible and automated way as possible. Uh, so we've done work with uh, our AWS Step Functions as our native uh, orchestration service that's serverless, uh, but we've also been working with the Cromwell and Nextflow to be able to help support uh, work like that. Also, our partner ecosystem in this is very strong um, and being able to run accelerated secondary analysis workflows from Parabrex and Dragon and Sention, um, all integrated to be able to help support that next layer of analysis. Uh, I, I will barely touch upon some of the work within the data aggregation and governance piece. Uh, we, we separate this out from the data transfer and storage uh, really to showcase the need for bringing these different data sets together and the kind of the authentication, authorization, governance, um, and aggregation to be able to make not just the, the data storage, but the data accessible for that next layer in the interpretation and analysis. Um, so we do separate out kind of that data layer in those two forms of not just how the data was created, but then how it was processed, how it can be aggregated um, and accessible. Um, and, and create that interoperability for those data types. Uh, ultimately, again, to bring the compute to the data and be able to uh, create that knowledge, interpretation, annotation analysis uh, for those applications I mentioned previously. But today, data transfer and storage. Uh, so I, I wanna dive in a bit more into those FAIR data principles uh, and not just speak at the, the high level and, and buzzwords, but how is it that we are thinking about some of the, the tools and ways of being able to manage it. Um, I'm not going to be talking about a, a data lake or a data warehouse or a data lake house today. Um, I, I wanna talk about the, the storage layer and the capabilities that need to be brought on top of it. We do have data lake formation. We do have the, the capabilities to aggregate all of these um, into a, a reproducible, repeatable, easily deployable um, infrastructure. Uh, but these are the core elements of what that, that data layer would be. Uh, and so within genomics, the, the data types that are coming in their raw form before they get processed are largely file and object storage types. Uh, and that maps very well to our, our S3 uh, object store. It's secure, cost-effective. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But when we're thinking about the, the data storage component and the, the FAIR data principles, um, the first thing is to ingest your data. Um, we uh, I'll speak more about data sync, but there's an entire fleet of services we have uh, to be able to help support data migration, uh, whether it's using our, our snowballs or our snowmobiles uh, and, and the different types of migration services we have. Uh, you know, the step one is get the data into the cloud uh, for that scalability and cost effective and, and shareability layer. Um, again, protecting and securing the data of utmost importance. Uh, we fully recognize, especially when we're talking about genome sequencing and human genome sequencing, 
this is not just data, it's representing individuals um, and that data and information is incredibly important to them and we do not forget that in this process. Uh, so ensuring that the data is properly protected, secure, has all the, uh, the logging, audit trails uh, and encryption capabilities uh, is, is really ground zero for us in terms of being able to help maintain that storage and the, the security and trust um, being able to manage and, and use this data. But that's delicately balanced with the need that, of why that data was generated and why that data is shared. Uh, so it, for the pr proper research uses or clinical applications, that data should have the proper permissions to be able to be findable by those proper individuals. Uh, and so we have a, a number of tools to help support the cataloging and searching of data um, of S3 as well as other data sources. Uh, and then all the IAM, the identity access management um, components to help support that accessibility layer, um, whether it's through API gateways or through our uh, authentication and um, sign-on principles, uh, being able to access that data uh, in a highly reproducible and, and secure manner. And then ultimately from those workloads I was describing, uh, it gets you into the processing and analytics uh, that helps support the, the interoperability of these data types um, and the, the use in the applications uh, and the reuse of the data in those applications. I won't be focusing as much on this part today, uh, but happy to talk about that with you at, at a later time. Uh, but ultimately this creates that, that core layer of being able to help support that fair data storage, fair data access um, and utilization of the genomic data. Uh, while this is still highly relevant to any of those other data types that um, you may encounter and want to couple with your genomic data as well. So I'm going to take a quick sip really quick. Because I'm going to spend some time on this slide. Uh, what I, what I want to walk through here are some of the main use cases um, and, and applications of how organizations have worked with us to be able to manage their data for both the data transfer as well as the storage. So to walk through, um, just kind of left to right, one of the, the main use cases is disaster recovery. Uh, if you are storing your data on premises today, you uh, may or may not have an external location that you're backing your data up to. Uh, you may have uh, tape archives that get shipped off every now and then. Uh, but what disaster recovery on AWS helps support is uh, an easy syncing mechanism um, and, and cost-effective approach to be able to uh, have uh, multi-region, multi-IZ um, availability zone access to storing your data uh, and make sure that those samples, especially at the scale you may be generating them, are not going to be lost over time. Uh, so Macrogen is one of the organizations we've worked with. Uh, they have over 15 petabytes of data that they were looking to back up and archive and do so in a global manner. Um, they they work in the EU and so need to follow GDPR uh, guidelines, as well as South Korea and the ISMS uh, regulatory compliance. So they wanted to be able to use a common infrastructure to standardize the way that they were doing their backup and disaster recovery. Uh, and so by working with us and using uh, Glacier, they were able to decrease the uh, cost by 35% while still increasing the uh, stability, durability, and automation of this process. Moving into some of the storage and administration, uh, Genomic Medicine Ireland is now part of Genuity Sciences, um, along with the, the Wuxi Netsco family. Uh, and what they were doing in Ireland was sequencing 400,000 individuals uh, to better understand the relationships of genomics, health, and disease. And so they were managing uh, you know, multi-petabyte data resource uh, and had zero tolerance for, for, for performance degradation. Uh, they wanted to streamline their storage administration and worked with us as well as our partner NetApp 
to be able to run 100 to 400 NetApp instances uh, and replicate files directly from the sequencer uh, with minimal lag time and ultimately be able to reduce the, the cost of that storage footprint that they were then able to pass back to the researchers, um, ultimately being the goal of uh, generating that data. Uh, so moving it from a DevOps perspective and moving to allow uh, the AWS infrastructure to be that storage layer uh, enabled them to free up their time, uh, excuse me, resources and money uh, back into the science around what it is that they were looking to achieve, um, in this case for the Irish population. Illumina, uh, clearly a major player in the genomic field, uh, and their base space application uh, runs on AWS. And they were looking to help improve cost optimization. You know, at the scale that, of data generation uh, and influx that we talked about earlier, uh, they wanted to realize the economies of that scale. And so by using uh, EC2 spot instances, which brings that compute to the layer and, and utilizes excess capacity of our instance types within regions, uh, as well as being able to um, bring in the S3 infrequent access tier. Uh, so for the data types that weren't regularly being accessed, they, they moved it to a different storage tier. They were able to decrease the cost per month uh, by $400,000, as well as in decrease their storage costs by $90,000. Uh, so these customer, uh, ultimately the, these charges and um, uh, cost optimizations can then be fed back to the customers um, and the ability to bring the compute onto that data layer helps improve the time to the science um, all through their base space application. Uh, when we're talking about cost optimization and, and that data footprint, I uh, also wanted to call out the work by Petagene. They've won the uh, best in class, best of show at BioIT World for three years in, in 2016, 2018, uh, and 2019 for their, their suite of tools. Uh, and one of the, the flagship tools that they have is their compression software. Uh, and so what they're able to achieve is a 4X rate of compression, uh, really, and working with a, a particular large-scale biopharma, they were able to help support a, a million dollars in cost savings over three years uh, by improving the, the storage footprint, uh, but also increasing it through the way that their software works, uh, the ability for that data to be processed. Uh, so the 220,000 whole exomes that they were processing, uh, they were able to do it at, at 10,000 files um, as opposed to the 1,000 files over, over that same time period. Uh, so it's a huge performance that they're able to achieve uh, and the, the security around their software tools, uh, but also that compression layer that helps within that storage footprint that you may be experiencing when you move to the scale. Uh, so I'm not going to talk specifically about the security services here, uh, but I do want to call out the use of clinical genomics data um, and the use case of fabric genomics that you know you need to operate at speed when you're thinking about clinical genomics. Uh, you know the the time to be able to get that knowledge and, and information and translation back to the individual is of the utmost importance, but you can't do that at the expense of overlooking security. Uh, so Fabric Genomics worked with us and was able to help improve their interpretation time um, from 12 weeks to two hours uh, and can is now able and has the capability of being able to deliver 10,000 reports uh, in two days. But again, all of this under the auspices of security uh, by using S3 and our EC2 instances, as well as our EBS volumes, uh, they are able to deploy their software globally while still meeting the regional uh, compliance and, and regulation of, of where it is that they are operating. So moving into the, the second tier here, um, data provenance I, I spoke about before is, is critical as part of that, uh, that data processing. Uh, AstraZeneca um, spoke uh, alongside AWS at our reInvent conference recently and showcased some of the amazing work that they're doing in their 
uh, their goal of being able to sequence 2 million individuals by 2026. And so ultimately, uh, let me get to my notes to make sure. Yep. Uh, so they are processing you know, vast amounts of data. They have 3.5 petabytes of data, uh, you know, thousands of exomes, 100,000 of exomes and genomes. Uh, and in, in running these process, they are doing over 12 billion statistical tests, being able to couple that genetic information with outcomes, uh, integrating with over 42 clinical trials. Uh, and ultimately, by being able to improve their processing pipeline, including this data provenance capture through um, the database file catalog and, and versioning control, uh, they were able to improve their uh, their informatics costs by tenfold per genome. Um, so huge amount of work and, and scale uh, and really cutting edge capabilities that they're they're working on there. Um, I I don't have a particular customer use case that I'm going to comment on for hybrid bursting, uh, but do want to call it out as a use case that we do see regularly. Uh, organizations may be operating uh, in, in local on-premises infrastructure, uh, but it encounter circumstances where they they need to be able to burst in the cloud. They, they have a certain level of scale that they need. Uh, they want to run a particular type of analysis. Uh, and so some of the uh, services and capabilities that I'll mention uh, shortly are, are those that help enable that. Uh, whether you're looking for local caching layer, moving the data quickly into the cloud and be able to um, run the entire analysis on AWS. Uh, we, we do see that pattern uh, happening regularly um, and, and probably more and more. Uh, and, and so this is an, an option uh, as you're thinking about how to be able to architect your workloads. Uh, data staging is also a, a major component. So when we're talking about uh, the data mobility, uh, there's the data storage layer, but then, as I was mentioning before, there's the need to be able to get that data in a research-ready form uh, and accessible for whether it's the processing layer uh, or the, the analytics and application. And Ancestry and Lyle are two use cases uh, that showcase how Ancestry is using EFS uh, to be able to do that. Uh, they have over 18 million people in their DNA network, and they're using EFS as their network, network file system uh, to help support the scalability and elasticity uh, of that, that data staging and, and use. Uh, and the EFS allows it to um, be, be sort of managed in such a way that the researchers are used to it. Um, whereas Lyle used FSx for Lustre uh, as part of their stage, data staging capabilities. Lyle is an organization that works on uh, computational protein design, and so they needed to be able to scale up um, you know, massive HPC compute clusters uh, to be able to do that, that protein design. Uh, and FSx allowed them to be able to run their simulations and analysis uh, in hours instead of weeks, uh, all while still reducing the cost. Um, and ultimately, this allows them to do more design analysis uh, at a rapid pace and increase their time to market. And then lastly, there's the data sharing component. Uh, you know, so by being able to run in the cloud, being able to store your data in the cloud uh, and, and enabling the, the proper security layers on top, uh, it allows you to be able to share the data and more easily collaborate. Um, DNA Nexus is one of our partners. Uh, that has worked in, in this use case with Baylor College of Medicine in the Charge Consortia, uh, where they were hosting over 430 terabytes of data uh, to allow five institutions globally uh, being able to access this data and, and run the analysis for heart and aging uh, related analysis and allow the the organizations to be able to onboard and access that data without the wait times of, of getting it, setting up infrastructure, setting up the analysis, uh, their platform was, was e more easily available and allowed for five times faster analysis um, in that use case. Uh, you know, DNA Nexus is also working with the UK Biobank to help in their data sharing of the, the 500,000 uh, individuals that have been sequenced there. Uh, and then we also have number of other partners and groups 
uh, whether it's Seven Bridges and Covatica for pediatric use cases, um, LifeFit working with Genomics England and their 100,000 genomes. Uh, you know, there's, there's a broad use case of being able to enable the data sharing uh, and the collaboration potential here. So just to kind of start rounding out the conversation, um, do want to get a little technical on some of the services and capabilities that uh, AWS offers to be able to support those use cases. Uh, and this is a, a high level diagram of that data transfer and storage. Um, moving from the, the sequencer or other type of um, device, using our data sync technology to move it into the cloud, uh, build out those research ready applications, whether it's for analytics and cataloging or for long term service and, and auditing and recovery. Uh, again, all security and provide privacy of utmost importance throughout the entire process. Uh, so, HIPAA compliance is, uh, you know, and security and privacy. Again, uh, really foundational. Uh, I'm mentioning HIPAA here that is relevant within uh, the America, but we also look towards other um, attestations, security compliance, um, and the, the global needs, uh, whether it's NIST or ISO. Uh, you know, we, we offer those capabilities across our different service types. Uh, as far as the data transfer, uh, AWS Data Sync is our, our recommended solution for the large scale data transfer component, uh, especially looking at genomics data and, and the scale and the velocity that you'll likely encounter. Uh, the, the goal of it is to simplify and automate that process. Uh, it can copy from NFS, SMB, uh, object stores. It integrates with, SF, uh, with S3, EFS, uh, FSx for Windows, FSx Luster. Um, and it offers end-to-end -end security and encryption through this process. Uh, it can help you parallelize uh, using multi-threaded architecture, uh, enable throttling, and can be coupled with our direct connect, uh, ultimately to help support that bandwidth connection capability to move the data into the cloud. Uh, the pricing is offered at a flat per gigabyte pricing uh, so that you, you have clear transparency of the cost in that process. Our storage gateway comes in three flavors, whether it's files, volumes, or tapes. Um, it's deployed as a virtual machine and, and connected to your applications and storage layer, um, whether it's systems, devices, or um, otherwise. And it uses a standard protocol and interface. Uh, it's low latency access and can also enable local cache, so it's good for syncing of the different file types, often with um, some of your other data types you may encounter. Um, and uh, can be utilized within our, our AWS storage layer. Uh, and again, thinking of that security component as uh, really critical, uh, it's tightly integrated within our CloudWatch services for logging, CloudTrail for audit control, uh, identity and access management for the uh, authorization layer, um, authentication layer, and uh, our key management services. So this can help enable either client-side encryption um, or, or AWS level encryption as well through that process. Uh, the storage classes, um, you know, S3 can also come from our, our hot to very cold uh, types of object storage. Uh, so S3 standard is where you'll put things that uh, are regularly accessed and needed. Uh, you can incorporate intelligent tiering for the data types that you, you don't know how often they'll be accessed, but you know that some of them won't be. Uh, and so it can help move into the more cost effective models. Uh, if you know they won't be accessed regularly, you can go ahead and tag them for the infrequent access. Um, and then for the long term storage and archive, we have our, our glacier and deep archive models as well. Uh, as far as genomics data goes, uh, there's the, the different types of data through that processing layer, whether it's your, your BCL files coming straight off the sequencer, uh, the FASTQ, the, or the smaller reads before you get to the binary alignment mapping, the, the BAM files, um, all of this part of the processing to get to your variant call file. Uh, this is the storage pattern we often see for organizations. Um, whether they keep it in standard of the hot storage uh, or if they, they purge and are able to replicate these data types because there is uh, duplicate information 
in them uh, and being able to store those, those workflow capabilities. Um, running out of time and I want to leave room for questions, so I'll, I'll just quickly um, discuss FSx for Lustre. It's great for that data staging layer. It helps hydrate your system, um, coupling S3 to your, your compute instances. Uh, it's supported as a data sig endpoint. Uh, it uh, can also mimic your local POSIX file system, uh, which organizations find really helpful um, as far as uh, their, their comfort level and the usage within the application layer as well. Uh, we also would be remiss if we don't talk about data that's already in the cloud and stored that you can access. Uh, our public data set program has over 74 different data sets in it, uh, largely open source so that you can treat these S3 buckets as if they're your own. Uh, there are some instances where controlled access data is incorporated and you need to go through uh, the data host authentication layer for that. Um, but as far as moving your data in the cloud and, and using data, uh, this is a great way to get at a single source of truth, as well as using our data exchange uh, for a subscription and publication model. Um, as you're thinking about maybe using real-world data, real-world evidence, uh, other types of data that may exist to couple with your uh, genomic information, uh, we, we work with a number of publishers that may be relevant uh, as part of your data pipeline uh, to be able to help inform you know, your genomic analysis. You know, we've, we've done a lot of work within the COVID-19 space here. Uh, this is an eyesore, but it brings it all together. Uh, showcasing how you can go from your genomic data, the technician, the sequencer, the local storage, using data sync to move into that data transfer layer. Um, the, the phenotypic data is uh, where we would also recommend considering that file gateway transfer. Uh, and then being able to integrate all of this, whether it's for storage and archival uh, or for that application and access. Um, being able to use your S3 storage, your, your data staging, um, and then moving into your analysis layer, letting your, your data scientists uh, be able to access that data along the way. Uh, we're here to help. So we, we do help organizations regularly be able to get started in the cloud. We have our AWS control tower uh, that uh, allows for multi-account setup. Uh, it helps you with governing new secure AWS environment with guardrails, provision accounts with, with a few clicks. Uh, we also have a migration acceleration program as you're thinking of how to assess, mobilize, migrate, and modernize uh, your, your data management. Uh, we, we have teams of people that are very knowledgeable about this uh, across genomics industry and otherwise, as well as a number of partners that can help you through that process. Uh, so last slide. Um, number of resources to find out more, but I will open up to Q&A and put the thank you slide here uh, to let you see my email. Please let me know if you have any additional questions past the five minutes that we do have now to talk, but thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lisa. That was such a great presentation. We do have a few questions, so I'm gonna dive right into those. Um, I think the first one was, um, uh, asking or pertaining to your previous slide with the the world map with the colors, it says what do the colors represent? So I'm not sure if you can clarify that. Oh, so that was in the the GA4GH and um, the the global side. You know, um, I I don't know if there is a hard and fast coloring to the the global. Um, I will get back to you on that one. Uh, I didn't make this slide, but I can find out. Okay, great. Next question, are there rules governing these genomic data? Who are the custodians of the data? Are there currently measures in place for accountability in terms of data access? <laughs> uh, so that really gets into the data aggregation and governance layer. Uh, there. Uh, I've, I've worked with a, a number of organizations in understanding how they're implementing it and there are patterns overall, but I I have not come across a, a hard and fast rule around the, the data stewardship. Um, one thing that the Global Alliance has done is to help define some of those standards for that interoperability. 
uh, and it utilizes things like uh, data use ontologies for data use agreements, as well as uh, researcher identities and passport visas uh, that can help integrate that. Uh, and then really it's, it's the ethic boards, the IRBs, um, and how all that is implemented. And that is often done on a, a per application per industry layer. Uh, but we've, we've worked across them. So we're happy to work with whoever asked that question to best understand how to implement it within their organization um, and showcase some of the things that we've come across in the field. Wonderful. You address genome storage of human and pathogen data. Might there be any discussion of possible usage of resources of agricultural crop and animal data? There's data available from the entire tree of life. Storage requirements? Question mark. Yes. So um, I focus on healthcare and life sciences in this talk. I kind of want to get to the open data uh, slide as quickly as I can. But agriculture is absolutely an area where genomics is highly relevant and increasing. Um, precision breeding highly overlaps the concepts around precision medicine of how to be able to increase the genetic diversity um, or increase the genetic gain while maintaining genetic diversity. Um, and then also being able to understand things like antimicrobial or antibiotic resistance. You know, this is relevant in how pesticides are applied, uh, it's relevant in how our animals are treated, and it's relevant how people are treated. Uh, so we, we work with a large number of agricultural organizations, uh, Bear Crop Sciences being one that uh, specifically I, I can mention, uh, and we have a number of uh, agricultural data sets that we we host as well, as well as um, you know, geospatial data sets that are important here. Uh, I got on a, an ag kick here. What, what, I think I'm missing the question though. No, I think you answered it. Um, so I think the point being that we do have a lot of um, data associated to other, other um, life forms, right? Um, and that those uh, are something to explore within uh, data exchange as well as open data program. Yeah. Yes. And this will be the last question because um, unfortunately we have to wrap up. Um, to use Data Sync, does this also require a service like Direct Connect? It does not require Direct Connect. Um, Data Sync does use a VM though. Uh, so there, there would be an on-premises uh, you know, VM that would be applied, but it does not require Direct Connect. Uh, we recommend it depending on the, the data size and volume that you'll be working with um, to help manage the throttling and bandwidth that you have, but uh, it, it can be applied independently. Great. Well, thank you again, Lisa or Dr. McFerrin, for, for such a wonderful presentation. I think it was really compelling. And to the audience, thank you for joining. Um, I just placed a few uh, links in the chat. You can find information about upcoming sessions as well as recordings and presentation decks on our series homepage, which uh, link is there in the chat. And before you leave, please take a minute to give us feedback on today's session. A short survey will pop up on the screen as we close out. We host these webinars for the research community, so any feedback you have is valuable and will help us to continue to deliver content that the community cares about. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.